Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 <laughs> this is so strange for me. I've never given a talk via Skype before. So I've done lots and lots of job interviews, and so now all of a sudden I feel like I'm on the other side. <laughs> I have a lot more sympathy for people when they have to do a job interview via Skype, that's for sure. Can anyone hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes? Great. Okay. Well, I'll start. So thank you for inviting me to um, talk to you today about Equality Archive as an open education resource. An open education resource is also known as an OER. I'm about to share the screen with you. Um, and as you can see here, this is the definition of an open education resource, an OER, from UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And the reason why I'm offering up this definition is because this is the one that um, I think is pretty much the standard bearer for responsible thinking about OERs. That is, an open education resource is a resource, an electronic resource, that contains educational materials that are in the public domain, that can be introduced with an open license, that can be shared freely and openly across borders, languages, nations, schools. Um, they can include anything that we could use in the, in the classroom. Um, and in our case, an OER, our OER, Equality Archive, is here, um, equalityarchive.com, and what it is, is it's a digital theater for the history of sex and gender equality in the United States. I'm just going to remove this for a second and see you. <laughs> this is so weird. Okay, so I teach at Baruch College, which is one of 24 colleges inside the City University of New York system. It's a public four-year college that's located in Manhattan. We have 18,000 students at our campus. And if you can imagine then, that if we have 18,000 students in our campus, it's pretty much a vertical building in a very urban, concentrated area, and it's part of a large system, we're talking about uh, more than 100,000 students, actually, inside of the CUNY system. And when I say that, I mean undergraduate students. Our students are, 40% of our students are first generation attending college, and they come from more than 130 countries, and they speak more than 160 languages besides English. So they're amazing students. They're incredible students. They are working class students. They commute to campus, mostly from one of the boroughs of New York, most usually from Brooklyn and from Queens. We have a fair amount of students who come from the Bronx. I say this to you because if you haven't been to New York, then you don't realize that maybe that from Manhattan, which is an island accessible by tunnels and bridges, um, our students get on the subway and they travel sometimes more than an hour each way to come to our campus for their education. And because they're working class people, most of them, um, very often that means that they are accessing the internet from their phones or from the resources available to them as students that would be through the library. Very often when we have digital projects as assignments in the classroom, those projects very often um, require students to borrow a laptop from the library. And I'm saying this to you because this is what I was thinking of when I was thinking about accessibility. I was thinking about how my students do work. I don't think of my students and the kind of students who study at CUNY and at Baruch, I don't think about them as non-traditional students. I think of them as students. And in fact, the trend is that the average age for students is well over 24. And at Baruch, the average age for our students is somewhere around 26 or 27 years old. Most of them have full-time jobs while they study. So this is, this is what I'm thinking about with access. I know that my students do their homework very often. They do their reading on their way, on their commute. I know that they have limited resources in terms of buying textbooks and books, which I very much encourage them to do. But I know that it's not always possible for me to have my students purchase books. We have programs at CUNY that make it so that our students can get free metro cards so that they can actually pay for their rides, because sometimes they don't have that. Sometimes our students don't have um, access to food. 
Um, and sometimes, oftentimes, our students are dreamers. So there's all kinds of factors that make me think about how my students, who I understand as the student, the model student for me when I think about Equality Archives, how my students can access information. And when I think about that, I think information needs to be mobile and accessible through their phones. And that's a really important um, aspect of, of thinking about this for me. And if you think about how we work as academics, we very often write very long essays, or we think about reading novels. I, I teach in the English department. I teach African American literature in the 20th century. Um, and I want my students to read novels. And we know that studies show that, that the muscle memory of literacy requires a student to turn a page rather than swipe left or swipe right. So I do very much um, celebrate the book or the hard analog text. At the same time, I know that the generation of students that we're talking about or that I'm talking about are seeking information through the internet, most notably through Google and through Wikipedia. And so those are two, two forces that I can't contend with. So I figured that the best way to contend with them is to join them. Um, and in that way, Wikipedia and Google are part of what is known as Web 2.0. That is, if there was a first internet was, that was sort of described as an information superhighway, Web 2.0 is that moment when Google, Macintosh, Yahoo, Apple, Wikipedia, et cetera, became the portals through which people needed to go in order to access the information. There's a lot of talk about Web 3.0, and we can talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, so that's my, my framework for thinking about accessibility and thinking about um, this project. The project itself came out of a collaboration I was doing with a colleague and friend, Michelle Havel Payan, who teaches at the University of Washington in Seattle. Michelle and I were editing a special issue of the feminist journal called Women's Studies Quarterly, WSQ. We did a special issue on the 1970s. And in that issue, like every issue for WSQ, we looked at a classic feminist text. And for our issue, we decided we would look at the Equal Rights Amendment. When we looked at the Equal Rights Amendment and just started refreshing our memories, the history of the Equal Rights Amendment, which passed Congress in 1972, and still has not yet been ratified by the United States Congress since 1972, and it had been presented to Congress every year since 1923, every year from 1923 to 2018. Um, we were really surprised as feminists and as educators that we didn't have all that information. We somehow kind of filed it away or buried it in our own intellectual memories. And so we decided to create a supplement for WSQ, an online supplement, an OER supplement, so that anyone could have access to it. Any curious person could learn about the history of sex and gender equality in the United States. We can talk a little bit later about how or why we chose just the United States, um, but that's what we chose, and I'm happy to explain to you why I chose just we chose just the United States. So. In New York, I decided that I was going to try to build this. Michelle had created an OER called Women Who Rock about um, women activists, mostly Chicana activists and musicians in the West Coast. And so she was kind of busy with that, and we were doing this project together, this, this journal project together. And so I made a side project around the Equal Rights Amendment. The first chair, the idea for the the Equality Archive was to create an opportunity for students to learn about the intersecting issues around sex and gender equality in the United States since the United States imagined itself as a, as a nation. And as a, as a feminist who thinks about intersectionality and assemblage and nonlinear ways of organizing knowledge, it was really important to me to think about how I could create um, a digital opportunity for students to sort of see the way those intersections worked. Um, and in so doing, I started to read more about hyperlinks. On the web, on the internet 2.0, most people find information through links. So for instance, um, if you are reading an article 
from, I don't know, New York Magazine or from the New York Times or the Washington Post or your local paper, very often they have links embedded inside of an article. So if you wanted to know more right there, instead of reading the footnote, you click on a link and it would take you to more or deeper information related to the article or topic that you started to read. When you think about it, you think about the ways in which we share information on, say, LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. Those are all links and hyperlinks, they're called, which if you click them, you can find more information behind that link. And some people argue that the web 2.0 is driven by links that are centralized through Google or Wikipedia or whatever your search engine might be, Firefox, Explorer, whatever. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to create these entries about sex and gender equality that were organized loosely around the people, the history, and the issues associated with sex and gender equality. I'm going to show you the page right now. Wave your hand if you can see it. Can you see it? Not yet. In a sense. In a sense. <laughs> Hello. Can you see this link? The webpage? We can see it, but yes. it's a yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you could see it. So if you take a look at Equality Archive, um, we can talk in conversation about um, the funding um, for it. Um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to create something around the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and as you can see here from the top, this is what you see if you looked at it from a desktop. If you looked at it on your phone, it would look a little bit different. Um, and if you looked at it on, um, depending on what kind of tablet you're using, it would look somewhere in between what it looks like here on a desktop screen or um, what it looks like on a tablet. As you can see at the top, my cursor, there are these these categories of organization, history, issues, people. There's a participate place that create that literally aggregates social um, organizations, civic engagement opportunities um, for any curious person who lands on Equality Archive if they wanted to get involved with an issue. Those social good organizations are also embedded inside of each article, which we call assets. There's also a collective, and I'm just going to show you really fast how that works. So the collective, this is a story about who contributes to Equality Archive. Unlike a lot of open education resources, like say Wikipedia, where anyone can contribute to Wikipedia, um, in Equality Archive, anyone can contribute, except that anyone has to then have their asset, their article, peer reviewed. And the reason for that is that we really wanted to make sure that our students could have an opportunity to, to use this resource for a guide to thinking about thinking more deeply about some of these issues so that you could use this in a classroom setting and know that the references and details are vetted. We um, offer up um, some definitions in this moment of the collective um, about open source, about why and how we use fair use, about the feminist press which publishes um, Women's Studies Quarterly and was also the first board for Equality Archive that did the initial peer reviews. And then this article that I think you read in Feminist Media Histories. We believe that collaboration is feminist practice. It's a practice that is not hierarchical and it creates an opportunity for us to not sort of privilege rock stars over a graduate student or an undergraduate student. And all of these people have donated their thinking as part of a collaboration as opposed to their thinking, their intellectual, work as part of a property. And again, this kind of folds into this practice, our understanding of Equality Archive as an open education resource, as something that is free and open and available to anyone who is curious enough to find it. These are our contributors so far. If any of you want to contribute, I am very happy to send you a file sheet. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Um, as I would say that Equality Archive is in its early stages and this summer we're going to give her a new look and add some bells and whistles at this moment and we also would like to always continually increase the assets, the articles and the intersections and assemblages that are possible when we think about gender and sex equality. If you go through this you can see a little bit about um, the Creative Commons, 
Um, and then these people at the end here, the feminists and allies contributed their skills and their generosity. I should say that Equality Archive really was a collaboration in that literally I created a GoFundMe page and I asked my friends who worked in a number of other professions besides the academy and some in the academy to donate either funds or skills. So for instance, a graphic designer friend created this archive, people donated the funds, and I was able to pay an underpaid graduate student to build this site. That graduate student is now my collaborator and we can talk more. Her name is Lori Herson and we um, wrote this article, Feminist Media Histories, together and we are in the process of writing another. Okay, so Equality Archive began with my thinking about the Equal Rights Amendment. As you can see here, there's a share button, and that share button is also really important to thinking about um, the way OERs work. OERs make it very easy for people to distribute and disseminate information. So if you can see here, you can share on Twitter, on Facebook, on Tumblr, which students love, and on LinkedIn. You can also share it through an email if you wanted to. So if you click on the Equal Rights Amendment, I wanted to show you this page. This, this entry is a little bit longer than most because it was the first entry. Right now, we're looking for entries to be about four to 600 words, and that is mostly because um, if a student or a young person or a curious person is reading this information on their phone, anything that's much longer than that is daunting for them. Equality Archive is also a multimodal site, and in that way, it includes sound, it includes video, it includes textual references, books, that is, that they can go to the library and find. As you can see, there's another button always to share. So in reading through the story of the Equal Rights Amendment, we create an opportunity for people to get involved once they start thinking about this new knowledge or this knowledge or this information that they have and they want to do something with it. You can also see on this side that there are tags here, and these tags are our way of trying to show assemblage, trying to show um, intersectionality and assemblage in every feminist issue. So what we do is we tag every entry that comes in, and then the tag becomes bigger or smaller, and they accompany on the side so that a curious person, if they prefer to read this way, they could click on a link and find more, or if they just decide that they'd rather read the narrative that surrounds our narrative that surrounds the Equal Rights Amendment, they can, they can look this way. And all of these highlighted forms are hyperlinks. I wanted to show you one. This is a video. Most of the videos we use are videos that are short and are available via YouTube. And the reason why we use YouTube is because YouTube is also functioning like an OER. That is, it's incredibly shareable. You can use it, remix it, and create playlists with it. Um, we have, for instance, if you wanted to click on a, a hyperlink, a link that's embedded within, very often it'll take you to another page, another entry, another asset that's in um, Equality Archive. And so if you look for a second here, you can see this is intersectionality, this, this entree. And if you look, again, these are all people, issues, and moments, historical moments that interact with our website. So if you clicked on Sojourner Truth, for instance, you can learn more. And as you can see, there are more hyperlinks inside. Um, there's always some kind of, of uh, moment um, for students to view a video or to listen to what they approach because we know that so many um, people are interested in or access knowledge, especially my students, they access knowledge through YouTube. Um, so we thought that we could go through YouTube ourselves and find those, those, those really useful moments and short ones that they can use. Um, as you can see, they click, they link together and so we can carry on and click on links and see the ways that, say, black feminisms connect with forced sterilizations, that connect with born women of all red nations. Um, we can go back and forth around these things and offer up opportunities for 
people to find them. If they wanted to, they could then go in here and say, look up, I don't know, anybody have a request? We could look up break. For instance. Um, Warren is an, is an organization. Immigrant woman. Immigrant woman. Immigrant woman. I'm sorry? Immigrant woman. Any? Immigrant women. Any? Yeah. Can you I'm tell her? Yes, she can't hear us. Is the mic? The mics are right there. Oh, How about wow. you? Immigrant women. <laughs> Emma. Immigrant women? Immigrant women. So what we have is we have borderlands. We have... Borderlands. Borderlands. <laughs> borderlands. <laughs> okay. So if you wanted to, you could look, you can see, for instance, on the on the side here, I just clicked, I just clicked rape, and under rape, all of these came up. This is a sort of organization of of our initial thinking, and this is part of the makeover. So, for instance, if you wanted to look up borderlands, sometimes the same categories intersect again, right? So let's just say you wanted to look up undocumented women. You can read this this entry, and then from here, a student or a curious person can learn a lot about one issue. They can read, they can watch, they can get involved, or they can listen, and they can get involved. Now, what we do here when we think about this is we think about all the, the key terms. So when someone submits um, an article or entry, they're not always thinking about the tags that we have. And so we have to find ways to connect <coughs> an asset that someone gives us and connect it with the tags that we create, or we can create new tags. And so for us, um, we have indigenous, we have um, borderlands, we have Chicana, Latina, Asian American, um, African American, Latin American, Native American, lesbian, LGBT, trans, this is how we've organized it for now. Um, I say that because we're really a two women show, or a one woman show, or a half a woman show, because this is a labor of love at this point. Um, but if you look, then you can see undocumented queer. So if you go from undocumented women, and you're thinking about even more specifically, what would it be like to be undocumented and part of an LGBT community that's already even more um, uh, targeted? Um, or if you're thinking about sexual assault, because undocumented women very often even have no repercussions for the sexual violence that they face, um, or few repercussions. So we think about that, and so when you go to sexual assault, we take, take it goes to our our education page about rape. Um, and in here, we talk about rape, and you can see here that it also includes undocumented women, transgender women. So then you can go to, a, a person can see the ways that all of these things intersect, so that in each instance, they have an opportunity to learn more and see really about the connections between um, each issue. Okay, I'm gonna get off the screen for a second. Okay, I can see better this way. All right, so we think of feminists, at least Lori and I and, and the collective, we like to think of feminist thinking as a disruptive opportunity to, an opportunity to disrupt linear thinking about knowledge and the hierarchies of knowledge. So, for instance, um, if, we have these tags that make it so that, that a curious person can find a way to access the intersections or the, the assemblages, the ways in which some of these issues, ideas, and histories overlap, then a student can, or a curious person can then get involved. And so as you can see from the pages that I just showed you, there's always embedded links with opportunities, national opportunities, um, to find more information, to volunteer, or donate. I really think of it more as volunteer opportunities. And so when we're looking for um, opportunities to civically engage or socially engage the issues that come up for them, then we often try to get those kinds of organizations that have opportunities for people to become involved. Um, 
And let's just pause for a second. So why OER? So we built this OER on WordPress, which is a collaborative, also collaborative um, system. And it's hosted by Reclaim, which is an education program that um, is also open education resource. And it was formed by former academics. And it creates an opportunity for us to actually own it. And owning this, this work is really important to us because I don't know how it works for you, but if we took money from our campus, then all of a sudden certain things or opportunities for engagement might become an issue for the funders. And so we like the fact that we're independent and free to connect ideas and opportunities. Um, and that's really important to how we're thinking about this theater of gender equality as nonlinear. We're thinking some more about um, this nonlinear organization, especially if you're talking to Amias about um, how you're thinking about mobility. Um, he said two words to me, and I thought, oh my god, I hadn't really. It's, there's always these blind spots, especially when you're doing this in between classes and in between the kinds of traditional publishing that we're all required to do um, as part of our university service. Um, but Amias said to me, well, we were thinking about ability, for instance. What about a person with um, a hearing impairment? And so we do have listening opportunities. But when he said it, and Lori and I have been talking about how we're going to write a grant and try to also just make some changes over the summer, one thing we're really excited to do is to create playlists, listening playlists, mm -hmm. and also start creating podcasts, original podcasts mm -hmm. that can get shared, disseminated. Um, inside of Equality Archive or on its own so that they can also have that sort of um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Tumblr opportunity so that people can actually hear it without having to um, read it. We've talked a lot about, um, after talking to Amyas, we talked a lot about thinking about the um, language. It's all written in English um, and I only, I'm only competent in English. I sort of have a I would confidently write a, write a sentence in the languages that I have studied, especially for something like this, but I'm very lucky in that we have students and colleagues who can. And so thinking about how to make some of these entries um, in other languages that our population speak, like Spanish, various um, dialects of Chinese, um, um, in Arabic, so those would be the three languages that come to mind first. And then in New York, it would also probably be Creole. How could we do that in a way that's really efficient? And I say that and be with no funding. Like, we have to create this <laughs> It's something that we do um, when we do these workshops with our students. Because what I found is that um, I do Wikipedia workshops with my students because we like to think of, um, at least I like to think of my project as a teacher is to encourage students to think of themselves as knowledge producers. And how can they do that and see that immediately is to be able to edit Wikipedia. Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation, is interested in, in Equality Archive because it also serves as a reference with media. And so Wikipedia, if you edit Wikipedia, you could actually use a link from Equality Archive as a source, as a citation, which is cool because um, Wikipedia is always looking for new sources, and because ours is period, when we're thinking about how we're going to update, let's say, Equality Archive 2.0, which should unveil itself in the fall, is that it's more accessible with video content, um, playlists, um, that has more opportunities for listening, including podcasts, to integrate additional languages to think about the web 3.0. And here's something that um, is new for us to, to think about, and that is the idea of blockchains and blockchain publishing. And places like Poet, for instance, po.et, um, that is this sort of um, blockchain publishing site that makes it so that um, any content, original content, can make it through the web without censorship. So let's say um, I write an article or you write an article that might be censored in China. If it was published on, say, Poet or a blockchain, that would be the Web 3.0, a decentralized web, then 
it would be impossible for, say, China to censor it. It has a lot of transgressive potential. It also has a lot of problematic potential. This, the, the rise of Web 3.0 and blockchain publishing, particularly in that it also makes it possible for all kinds of alt-right um, hate groups, fascists and others, to take advantage of this and remain anonymous and then disseminate their information without any kind of um, um, filter. Um, and it's one of those moments where we're just kind of watching and reading all about this now to think about how, where we can enter um, as feminists. And then um, finally to think about that decentralization as something that was always our model when we were thinking about Equality Archive. We were thinking about the model of it being free and accessible. Equality Archive doesn't, um, doesn't ask for uh, email address. It doesn't track users. What it does is it tracks pingbacks. And so if someone lists it for a class, you can see how many times or where there's a link that goes from us out. And so for instance, there are some, when I'm in my administrative page on that website, I can see when there's a pingback on, um, like say, more women of all red nations. I can see that when gets a lot of pingbacks because when people are looking for it, they can't find that much concentrated information. And a lot of times in the classroom, a lot of faculty are resistant to using Wikipedia as a source, as a reliable source. And so Equality Archive 